Hello Matrix and welcome to Waza Matrix. My name is Looney and today we're assisting you with your final exam prep for accounting. All you need to do to get your questions and comments through to us is hit us up on our social media platforms, search for Waza Matrix as well as our WhatsApp line. All of the details are on the screen. Don't forget guys, we've got a cool competition going on for you, so please stay tuned to get all of those details later on in the show. I've got Pumza, our sign language interpreter with me, as well as our awesome teacher, Ashraf. Thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Thank you, Looney. Welcome, grade 12s. Yes, you with Ashraf Patel. We're looking at accounting paper two today. Remember to prepare you adequately so that you ace that exam. What are we focusing on in today's lesson? We're looking at creditors reconciliations, we're looking at cost accounting, and obviously we're looking at cash budgets. However, before we even move into creditors reconciliations, remember there are two types of creditors reconciliation. One is an internal creditors recon, where you are reconciling the creditors control account with your creditors list. Remember it's internal, it's for our internal records to ensure that our internal control processes are in place. And the second type of reconciliation in creditors that you get is the external creditors recon. Here I'm referring to reconciling the creditors statement that we are receiving from our creditor with the creditors ledger account as it appears in our account. Remember, that's why we refer to it as the external creditors recon. Remember the word reconciliation means to bring together. So what are we bringing together in this case here? Let's look at it. What are we expected to reconcile? They're telling us the balance of future traders in the creditors ledger of generation suppliers, right? And the balance on the statement received from future traders. Okay, so let's understand what we're doing. We are obviously generation suppliers. In our account, in our creditors ledger, we have an account for future traders. That means we are buying goods. Who are we? Generation suppliers. We are buying goods on credit from future traders. So what's future traders going to do? They're going to send us a statement. So there's the statement that we are receiving from future traders. Now, why the reconciliation? Obviously, look at it. According to our ledger account, we owe them 21,130, right? That's according to our records. Okay, in terms of the statement that we are receiving from future traders, they're telling us, sorry, you are owing us 32,600, right? Obviously, because of a whole host of reasons, the two are not the same. We have to now reconcile and see why are these two figures different. And that's the objective and purpose of the creditor's reconciliation statement. In this case, as you can see, it's an external one. We are reconciling the ledger account. There we go, with the statement 32,000. 600. Okay, guys, now let's, let's look at each individual reason to see why are the two not reconciling. Okay, what are we told? We are told that an invoice of 13,300 received from future traders was correctly recorded in the creditor's ledger account. Right, immediately you, are, you can see the creditor's ledger account is correct. You are told that. Was correctly recorded. The amount was incorrectly recorded as 11,200 on the statement. Right. So immediately you tell yourself, right, the error is not in our records. The error is on the statement, as you can see. So how do we deal with that? This is what we're going to do. Here's my creditor's ledger. Our records in our books, that's that one there, right? And the statement that we are receiving 
there. So obviously, it's point number one, you start off with the two balances, or sometimes it's pre-populated for you in your answer book. If it is not pre-populated, by that I mean it's not appearing in your answer book, then make sure you write in those balances so you know that those are the two figures that you want to reconcile, bring together. Got it? Okay, now my error. What am I told? Remember we said the error was on the statement. It was recorded as 11,200 instead of 13,200. So clearly you can see, sorry, not 13,200. Let me recorrect that. So we, we know it was 13,300 instead of 11,200. And the difference between the two is a figure of 2,100. Where's the error? The error is in my statement. Where do I correct it? I correct it in my column, which deals with the statement. What was happening with the statement? The statement was undercast. It had too little in it. How much too little? The difference was the 13.3 minus 11.2, which is the 2,100. And this operation is important. I'm adding it to my statement. Can you see? So what am I doing? I'm correcting the error. Because there's an error on the statement, I'm focusing my energies on the statement for that particular one, and there you can see is my correction, right? So number A, as the examiner wanted, is done and dusted. Let's go to the, the next one. Generation suppliers entered a 10% discount relating to a payment of 3,000 Rand on the 19th of February, 2020, right? So we have generated, we've entered uh, a 10% discount relating to a payment that we made of 3,000 Rand on the 19th of February. Uh, future traders did not approve this discount, stating that the payment was received late. So obviously you can see now that you have entered the discount. Future traders said, sorry, you were late. And as a result, you're not entitled to the discount. So now we have to do the correction. First question that you ask yourself, where is the error? Is the error with future traders or in our books? Obviously, in this case, it relates to our books. And what are we going to do? Because we had, ex we, we had taken the, the discount into consideration, we reduced the amount that we were owing to them. Isn't that correct? But now they've disallowed that and said, sorry, you were late. You are not entitled to that discount. We now take that amount and we add it back to our account. Watch, the error is in generation suppliers. Because our information is incorrect, we need to correct our books and this is where this is the distinguishing factor you need to ask yourself where's where must I correct it in their records or in our records in this case it's our records and therefore we add the 300 rand because they like I said early on we took the discount and they said no you're not entitled to it so we now add back that amount of 300 rand okay next challenge the next challenge is, goods returned, 500 Rand, appeared on the statement received. The bookkeeper of generation suppliers forgot to record this transaction. Once again, when you come to a discrepancy, the first question that you ask yourself is, who made the error? Is it future traders? Is it us, generation suppliers? Clearly you can see. Goods returned appeared on the statement. That means they have the information. We do not have the information in our records. Therefore, we have to update our records. And clearly you can see what have we done. Goods were returned to our suppliers. And when we return goods to our suppliers, it reduces the amount that we are owing them. And as a result of that, because we are reducing the amount, you can see the minus 500 where in our books, in the books of generation suppliers, we did not record the transaction. We now have to record the transaction. And how do we do it? 
by saying minus 500. Why? Because there was a return of goods. Got it? Great. Let's move on. The next uh, difference that was identified was purchases of 3035 from future traders were recorded as a debit note in the creditor's ledger account. Okay, understand the difference. You have to understand the difference in order to do the corrective measure. Once again, purchases of 3035, that means we purchase goods from whom? From future traders. These were recorded as a debit note. In other words, our records show that we sent goods back to, uh, to our supplier, namely, namely future traders. But that's not the case. We didn't return goods, we purchased goods. Watch this one. Okay? Because we had purchased goods, right? Initially, what was the initial error? that we had made. We treated that as if we returned goods, right? Now, I'm gonna do this for you here so you can see it. But remember, in your answer book, you don't do this. I'm just doing it as a, as a means of explaining it to you. So initially, we recorded here an amount of 3035, right? In our records, obviously. Um, let's just redo that so we have a bit of clarity. Let's just pick that up. I just want to show you this here. Let's not get confused here. Okay, let's pick up our pen again. Okay, what I'm saying is that we showed it as if we had returned goods to them, right? So we decreased the account by 3035. Now, if I only bring in one 3035, this one here, by increasing my account by 3035, it means I'm only cancelling out the error. Do you see that? And therefore, in order to effect the correct entry, I have to double the amount. Why? Because the initial one, I showed it as a return, which was incorrect. So by merely putting in one 3035, by increasing it by only 3035, I'm actually just cancelling out the initial 3035, which was my initial mistake. Therefore, to correct it, I need to double the amount. And clearly, you can see the amount being doubled here, and therefore, an amount of 6070. Okay? So remember, read the transaction and know exactly where the error is. Step number one is the error in our records or in the records of the supplier. Then do the corrective measure wherever it needs to be corrected. Okay, let's go to the next difference. A direct transfer of 7,000 Rand by generation suppliers, which is us, we, we, we've made an EFT into the account of future traders, was recorded in the cash payments journal on the 27th of February 2020. A discount of 700 Rand for early payment was also recorded, right? The statement of account from future traders was dated the 25th of February. Okay, now clearly, what's the challenge? You've recorded a payment by means of an EFT, an EFT means an electronic funds transfer, remember? That's the way to go nowadays because we don't have checks anymore. So therefore, in this particular instance, the payment was made by EFT. The payment was made into the account of future traders, as you can see, by whom? By generation suppliers, which is us. However, we made that payment on the 27th of the month. But we had already received our statement from our supplier on the 25th of the month. In other words, that amount is reflected in our records, it is there, it is not appearing on the statement which we, it can't appear because we've already received the statement. Therefore, once we have received that particular statement, now we do the correction or the, the, the entry. Remember, there were two entries involved there. One was the receipt of where they're going to be receiving the amount of 7,000 Rand. 
which you can clearly see here. That's the first part of the transaction. And the second part of the transaction was the discount that we had claimed because of early settlement. Remember, there's two transactions involved. The payment, obviously, a credit to bank and a debit to creditors control. So you're reducing your creditors control by the 7,000 Rand, which you are paying them. And the second part of the entry, a debit to my creditors control and a credit to discount received. Remember, we're claiming a discount for early payment. And as a result of that, you now have two entries, namely the bank amount as well as the discount to give you a total value of 7,700. Okay, now what do you do? You start off with your opening balance of 21,130 plus the 300 minus 500 plus 6,070 will give you 27,000 as your final figure for your hour records. Let's look at the statement. You start off with the 32,600 plus the 2,100 minus 77 and voila. What do we get? 27,000. A great feeling when the two balances, because now you know you have reconciled your creditor's ledger with the statement that you have received from your creditor. Well, guys, we've now reconciled. We're on good terms. On a good note, we take a break. Don't stray or go away. See you soon. Back to you, Looney. Thank you, Ashraf. Matrix, don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll see you after this. We're back from the break, Matrix. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. If you've just joined us, we are doing your final exam prep to help you with the upcoming exams. This next competition is for anyone who's constantly running out of data. So if that's you, listen up. Wazimatrix is bringing you the hashtag Wazawina competition, where two lucky matrix stand a chance to win two gigs of data. All you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Ashraf, and over to you. Thank you very much, Looney. Yes, guys, remember, focus, pay attention, and yes, at this time, in preparation for your final exams, you should be screening out the answers as we are talking, right? What are we looking at now? We're looking at, we've done the creditors recon, we're now looking at cost accounting. What does this question focus on? It says here, calculate the break-even point for the company H2O on the 29th of February 2020. It also tells you to explain why Wally should be concerned about the profitability and sustainability of the business, give two points with figures to support your answer. Please, grade 12s, examiners, when they are busy with your scripts, and the question says, give two points with figures. You have to give figures because obviously marks are allocated to those figures. So, and the figures are given to you in the question. So you have to identify the relevant figures, quote them to support your answers. Very important examination tip. Okay. This is the information that we have. We are told that our variable costs, and once again, know your variable costs. What are they? Firstly, what is a variable cost? A variable cost is a cost that varies with the levels of production. As your production increases, your variables cost would increase, right? For example, if you're using uh, material, you're using leather, as your production of leather bags increases, you're going to use more material. So those are variable costs. What happens to them? They vary with your levels of production. Then you get your fixed cost, and these remain fixed, right? immaterial of the levels of production. Okay, now, we now come to the question which said, calculate the break-even point, and, okay, just more information, let's just go through the information first, we'll come back to our question. We are also told that the number of units that you produced and sold this year amounted to 110,500, right? 
compared to 98,000 last year. Obviously, you can see an increase. The break-even point last year was 78,000 units. The break-even point this year is what we have to calculate. Okay, and this is how we go about doing the calculation. Step number one, you must know the indicator. Yes, you're going to get a formula sheet, right? But the formula sheet will not identify the particular indicator for you. You need to know which one to use and also the name of that particular indicator. Once again, grade 12s, your exam is a few minutes away or maybe seconds away. Make sure that you know your financial indicators. Very, very, very important. Okay, so here goes. What is my break-even point? It's my total fixed cost in rands. Let's see if we can identify that. We want our fixed cost in rands. So obviously, it would be your fixed cost in rands, which is 795,900. Now, obviously, another examination tip. You know that fixed cost is made up of factory overheads plus your admin cost. Those are your fixed costs. But because it's given to you and it already appears as a total, there's no need for you to add those two figures. It's given to you already. So immediately you just take that figure, 795,900. Here goes. Take your 795,900. There it is. Over your contribution per unit. Now, what is my contribution per unit? It is my selling price per unit minus my variable cost per unit. Let's see if we can identify that. Here we have the selling price per unit, which is 18 rand and 85 cents. So once again, that's given to me. So selling price per unit, 18.85. Okay, take that and use it. There's my 18.85, my selling price per unit, minus what? My variable cost per unit. Let's identify that one. My, my variable cost per unit is 11 rand and 75 cents. Obviously, because it's given to you, you can get the information directly from the question. If it is not given, obviously you would add material plus labor plus selling and distribution. But in this case, it's given to me as 11 rand and 75 cents. Therefore, what do we do? There goes 18.85 selling price per unit minus variable cost per unit of 11 rand 75. And if you do the calculation here, you're going to get a figure of 112,098,59 if you round it off. 112,099 units. So that, people, is your break-even point. Remember, this answer must appear in units. Very important, because the break-even point is the number of units that we have to manufacture to ensure that at that point, at the break-even point, we neither make a profit or a loss. At that point, your profit is equal to zero. Right, so that's your break-even point. Okay, so one part of it is the calculation of it, the application part of it. Now, there was another question, and the question said, explain, explain why Wally should be concerned about the profitability and sustainability of the business. Give two points with figures to support your answer. Right. Let's look at this now. Now, this is the interpretation part of the question. What are we supposed to say? They did not produce and sell enough products to break even. Why? Let's look at the information. What do we have here? The units produced and sold was 110,500, right? However, my break even point was 112,099. Can you see a comparison? You're drawing a comparison between the number of units produced and sold as opposed to the number of units that you had to produce to break even. There you can clearly see. There's your break even point, 112,099, whereas you only produced and sold 110,500. Clearly you can see what happened. They needed to produce an extra 1,599 in order to break 
even. So they produced below the break-even point. This means, obviously, that they're making a loss of how many units? 1,599. Where's the 1,599 coming from? The difference between your break-even point and the number of units produced and sold. Let's just do this to make it much more clearer. There we go. There's my break-even point, and there's the number of units produced and sold. So in other words, they, they had, if they wanted to, they can see that in this particular, if you do your comparison from the figures that we were given, we produced and sold 12,500 units more. That is correct. That is correct. Compared to last year, there was an increase in production by 12,500, but the break-even point went up by 34,099 units. So all, all, that will also give you an indication that although we produce more, the break-even point increased by 34,099 units. Okay, so one is to calculate the break-even point, and number two is to understand, interpret the data and be able to comment on it. Very important. Okay, let's move on. In this particular part of the question, you are told the business specializes in the production of security alarms. The financial year end is the 30th of September 2019. You are required to calculate and complete the following, namely the factory overhead cost note for the year. Right. Now, obviously, this is one component of the production cost statement, which is your factory overheads note. What are we expected to do here? Watch. These are the items that you've identified or appears in your answer book as your factory overhead. It's the indirect materials. Uh, let's just change the color so it's clearer for us there. It's the indirect materials, right? It's the insurance. It's the rent, expense, and the indirect labor. So those, you must also know which components would be part of my factory overheads note. In other words, which expenses relate to the factory? Okay, we are told here that you've got information of raw material stock, beginning of the year, end of the year. Your arrow is of paramount importance. So you know that's the beginning of the year and that's the end of your financial year. You are told your raw material stock figure and your indirect materials stock figure. Okay, now let's go directly into my calculation. I'm expected to calculate my indirect materials, right? And there goes. Let's start with the indirect materials first. Step number one, take your balance of indirect materials at the beginning of the financial year, right? And that's 14,100. Let me just show you where it is so you can identify with it. There's your indirect materials. Beginning of the year, 14,100. Okay, we've got that figure there. Now, what else do we want to know? What was the value of the indirect materials that were purchased during the year? So therefore, I look for my information here, and I find that, sorry, let's just go back, it's here. Here's it. Indirect materials bought during the year was 250,400. Okay? So that's the value of my indirect materials that were purchased. So therefore, going into my question once again, into my solution rather, there's my 250,400, the value of my indirect materials that were purchased. Okay, there was no other information, but you could look for a return of indirect materials, indirect materials stolen, any other additional information. In this case, no additional information. So you've got your opening value of indirect materials. You've got your purchases of indirect materials. What was the value of my materials at the end of the year? Remember, I'm told 2,730 was the value of my materials at the end of the year. Therefore, I say minus 2,730. Watch the calculation, guys. Opening stock plus purchases minus closing stock. However, it doesn't end there. 
Then, what part of the indirect materials was used for the factory? You are told that one-fifth of the materials was used in the factory. Therefore, you take that figure to get a final answer of 52,354. What is that? That's the value of indirect materials that were used by the factory. Okay, let's move on. The next one we're looking at is the monthly insurance. They're telling you that your monthly insurance has remained constant for the last two years, right? Insurance paid for the year amounted to 121,000 520. That's the value of insurance that you've paid. Okay, then you are told that this includes insurance paid in advance for October and November 2019, right? Insurance for the current year to be allocated to the selling and distribution department is that, and the amount for your um, admin section is 22320 for the admin section, and the rest for the factory. So taking all of that information into account, we now have to work out what was the insurance value for the factory. Okay, let's look at our calculation. Immediately you tell yourself that 121,520 was the total amount that was paid for insurance okay now remember they told you that it included two months that were not in the financial period so the first step that you take there is you take the amount and you put 12 over 14 because you want the amount for this year right so step number one find out the insurance value for this year and you do that by taking the 121520 Let's just identify that figure once again. Uh, there's it, 121,520. There's my insurance figure. And because it included the two months, we only take 12 over 14. Right, now, once you have that figure, let's take that figure of 121,520. Okay, let's do this. 121. 520 times 12 divided by 14 and that will give me a figure of 104160 that's now your insurance for the current year however you are told that based on the information that you have there was a figure for uh, 44640 right so let's go here Minus 44640 minus 22320, and you are now left with a figure of 37,200. Let's check our this thing, our calculation. There we go. There's my 37,200. So, what am I doing? I'm removing the insurance of the other two sections of my factory because I need the insurance only for the factory. So there, that was the, for the other two components. That was my other two components, the other two departments of the factory. I removed that to be left with the 37,200 which is allocated to the factory. Okay, we, as soon as, we're not done with this note as yet guys, as soon as you get back, we will continue with this note to complete it so that we know we've done this note in its entirety. Take a break, refresh, see you just now. Thank you, Luni. Thank you, Ashraf. Matrix, let's take a quick break and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. We are still assisting you to help with the upcoming exams. Thank you so much, Ashraf, and over to you. Thank you, Looney. Okay, guys, remember, we were busy with the, the note for your factory overheads. We're almost done with it, so here we go. What are we told? We are told that the rent 
for the selling and distribution department amounts to 171,500. Be very careful about the information that is being provided. They're telling you the rent for the selling and distribution department amounts. They're giving you not the total rent, but the rent for the selling and distribution. However, you are told that the factory and the admin section are as follows, 60 for the factory and five for admin. So in other words, the 171,500 is your 35%. How do we get that? 100 minus 60 minus your five, and clearly you can see now in my calculation, what do I do? I take the 171,500 times 60 over the 35, right? To give me my figure, which is my 294,000 for my factory rent, okay? And then the last one was my indirect labor. And based on the information that I have, I'm told that factory indirect labor, year goes, is made up of the gross wage or salary, which is your 312800, but you also had contributions. And remember that your contributions must be added. Remember, we spoke about this when we did the income statement. And I want you to see that this knowledge, you don't, even, you don't remember only for paper one, but it could be used in paper two as well. And therefore, you can see that your contributions must be added to your gross salary to get your total expense. And here it is evident where you see there's your gross salary plus your contributions to give you your total amount for the indirect labor for your factory. Okay, guys, that's it for the cost accounting part of the question. Let's move on to the last part, which is our cash budgets. Okay, and in this one here, the first question says, explain why a business needs to prepare a cash budget every year. Right, okay, let's look at this question here and look at the answer, the response that is expected from you. One, to plan for future, and this is the critical part, receipts and payments. You will also notice on this particular slide, we're saying, do not accept incomes and expenses. The reason we are dealing with a cash budget. When we're talking cash budget, we're talking receipts and payments, guys. Very important. So, to plan for future receipts and payments in order to ensure that they have enough cash on hand. To predict or to calculate your bank balance, yes. To prioritize, in other words, take corrective measures from previous deviations. In other words, in previous deviations, if we spend too much on a particular item, we need to take corrective measures to ensure that we don't make the same mistake. So that's the reason why we prepare a cash budget every year. Okay, the next one said, calculate the expected receipts from debtors for November 2019. In other words, if you're looking at your extract from your cash budget, you can see you are working out this figure here. Your expected receipts from your debtors for what month? For November 2019. Now, what information do we have? We are told here that, let's look at the information, that, um, well, let's find the information here. Okay, from here you can see that your cash sales amounts to 75% of total sales, right? So step number one, they're telling you that 75% of your sales are for cash. So obviously your credit sales would be 25%. Simple, simple maths. 100% is my total. If 75% was the cash, then 25% has to be my credit sales. Now remember, if you're looking at expected receipts from debtors, what figure do you need? You need your credit sales because that's the amount you're going to sell to your debtors and based on that, they are going to pay you. So the moment it comes to your amount expected from your debtors, the figure that you need to focus on is your 
credit sales. Okay, so you, now that you know that if 75% was total sales and you, your debtors are paying you within 30 days, you start off by doing the following. Watch. 180,000 was your cash sales. There we go. Let's just pick up our pen. 180,000 rand was your cash sales, right? But you know that you wanted only the 25% of that figure. In other words, you first come to a figure of 60,000 rand. And that would be your credit sales component. Okay, look at the calculation, 100 over 75. Okay, once you've identified your credit sales, you are told in your information that debtors pay you less 5%. That means they are entitled to a 5% discount. Therefore, in your calculation, the easier method, grade 12s, is to just take the amount of your credit sales first, once you've identified it, you've got your credit sales to be the 60,000, times 95%. Why 95%? Because your debtors are entitled to a 5% discount. Therefore, take that figure times 95%, and that will give you your 57,000. Or you could then do a calculation if you want to do, but obviously it's going to take time, because remember you're writing against the clock. And therefore, the quicker you get to your answer, the better. But you could also do this. Work out the 60,000, which we've done. Then work out the 5%, which obviously would be the 3,000. Then would subtract that from it will give you the 57,000. But the easier method is take your 60,000 times 95%, and you come to your answer immediately, namely the 57,000. That's the figure that we expect our debtors to pay us in the month of November. Right, next one. You are given, they're telling you the rent income was increased by 9% when on the 1st of November. Right? It was increased by 9% on the 1st of November. Calculate the rent income for October. Okay? So clearly you can see that if the November figure is 10,464, that is your figure which includes, which includes the increase of 9%. In other words, in other words, grade 12s, this 10,464 in terms of percentages is equal to 109%. Where do I get that figure from? 100 was the initial figure plus the 9% increase to give me 109%. Okay, so watch my calculation. There's it. 10,464 is the figure which includes it, divided by 1,09. Where are we getting the 1,09 from? 100 over 109. Remember, that's your, the 109% is your total, and therefore you will find that the figure prior to the increase, which is the 100%, is your 9,600. Okay, so if we have to draw up this in terms of a calculation, let's do that. 10,464 is equal to 109%, right? Because it includes the increase. Therefore, the 100% would be your unknown. Clearly, you can see your cross, your, 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 your calculation will be 10,464 times 100 divided by 109. So 100 times 100 divided by 109 times this will give you the 1,09, which we're using as, to, I'm explaining to you why we're using the 1,09. And that's your final answer, namely 9,600. Okay, next one. As the internal auditor, you discover that actual motor vehicle expenses for December were 9,600, give two points that you would include in your internal auditor's report. In other words, you can see here that, let's look at the information so we know what we're talking about. Okay, that was just a question based, I think, on the information. You didn't need information, they're just telling you. You discover that actual motor vehicle expenses was 
were 9,600, and obviously they, they, we must have used more than that, so we overspent the budget. Right, so now, how do we respond to that? Firstly, the actual expenses exceeded the budget amount. In other words, you overspent the budgeted amount. So you budgeted X amount, but you spent more than that, so you overspent, you exceeded what you had budgeted for. Okay, now, it may be possible that it may be for a good reason. Let's look at the responses. Maybe the unexpected increase in fuel prices and maintenance costs resulted in that. You have no control over the, the, your fuel costs. Yes, you budget, but it could happen that it would, incre it would increase more than the budgeted amount. As a result, you're going to spend more, right? Two, the use of vehicles need to be investigated in order to ensure that vehicles are used responsibly and no abuse is taking place. Very important, people, because remember, accounting is part of internal control. We need to control to ensure that we safeguard the assets of a business. So check if there's abuse of the vehicles, then obviously corrective measures have to be taken. Right. Also, we need to ensure that our vehicles are serviced regularly in order to avoid unexpected repairs. Yes, if you've got a maintenance budget, spend it and ensure that your vehicles are kept in tip-top condition so you don't have unexpected expenditure. Okay, guys, that's the end of our lesson. A few tips for your exams. What do you have to do? Go to bed early the night before the exam. Please, this idea of staying up late before the exam is definitely not good for you. You must be well prepared long before the exams, right? Read the instructions carefully. Yes, remember, what do we say? RTF. You. All right? And then manage your time. Make sure that you spend the time that is allocated to that question, to the uh, question that you are answering. Don't spend more time on it because then you are depriving another question and you may then end up not completing the question paper. We don't want that to happen. And yes, definitely, from me, Ashraf, remember what we said, we'll end off by saying, aim for the stars. A chance if you don't get there, you're definitely going to be a shining star. Ashraf's shining star. Looney, over to you. Thank you, Ashraf. Matrix, it's been a good show. I hope you did enjoy it and you got as much information as you needed. Everything of the best for your final exams and remember to use our resources to help you prepare. Congratulations to all of our competition winners who will be announced on Facebook after the show. Don't forget to check out our schedule on www.wasamatrix.co.za and if you missed any of the lessons, they are available on YouTube, so please subscribe and give them a big thumbs up. From me, Looney, Pumza and Ashraf, thank you and goodbye. Welcome to our lounge, our very busy lounge, and I would like to just introduce our team to you. This is Paul sitting over there. Hola, hola, shop, shop. And this is Hannah. Hi. Renilwe. Hi. Pradesh, who's sleeping on the floor over here. And this is Jonathan, who's Hi. fiddling. And I'm Darlene. So today, we are going to be speaking in this session about study techniques and how you process and what is the best way for you to process. So we have to remember that each one of us learns differently. And if we try to learn like somebody else, it may not stick. So we're looking at how we can help you to process incoming information. Now there's three ways to do that. We are either visual or we're auditory or we're tactile kinesthetic, which is just a huge word for touch, move, do. We like to move a lot when we're processing and learning. So when we are looking at these three areas, that we would call our learning styles. So what I've got over here is we're wanting to bring out the best in your studying and we're looking at, I've asked the team 
to show us how they study the best. So first of all, I, I love sitting when I'm working on my computer, this is how I sit. So that's why I'm like this, because I can't sit up straight behind a, a table. I like to sit and work on the couch. It's my best position. So we're gonna look at the different positions and see what guys are doing, not just positions, but how are they studying and processing. So Paul, we've got something very interesting over here. Paul, what are you doing? Because you're sketching some fancy sketch over there. Yes, 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 yes. Mm, my useful technique of studying is just to make sure that I capture the emotion of the lesson or of what I'm studying. So here we're talking about the feelings of an abstract wise so that I can be able to remember what I'm reading or what I am learning. Because emotionally we get attached to what we see and what we feel inside so that I know that okay. I can be able to come back to that kind of a lesson or that kind of a subject with emotionally, uh, emotionally attached to it. Okay. And so it looks like abstract, kind of okay. like an emotional. Colors and flowers. Yeah. All right, so yeah. sorry, guys. I'm standing all over us here in this lounge. I wish you could be here with us because you could see all these things. Hannah, I see Hannah is actually looking at, she's looking at some lessons online. Yeah. We would call it tutorials. And so this is how she likes to learn. She's pretty much visual. So I would say that, uh, Paul, you're a bit more of a, a tactile kinesthetic learner. You like to, mm -hmm. to look at and move, but you're also writing. Hannah, you like visual, visual print, visual picture. Yeah. You're looking at pictures. She's looking at pictures. She's not playing a game, okay. Uh, Hannah, and then, sorry, not Hannah, Renil Uh Let's leave you for a bit. Jonathan, seriously, are you actually listening to me? <laughs> Uh, I'm actually listening. This is actually the way I learn. Okay. Uh, to learn, I like to move my body and I like to say what I'm learning. So you like to hear your voice, mm -hmm. your own voice. Okay, so that's very important for us because some of us like to talk and listen to our own voice and answer ourselves. No, you're not getting mad if you answer yourself. So I think that's an important... Show us, take a concept. Okay, so for maths, we're doing functions. So the equation for straight line function is y equals mx plus c. So I go... Y equals mx plus c, and that helps me learn. And it helps you with your movement? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Some of us would say you're distracting, but anyway, at least you don't do that in class. What are you, oh, what are you doing over here? Well, as you can see, I'm a visual print learner. I love using color when I study. All right, but you've written all over your book. I think that'll freak out quite a few teachers. But I think the color helps me understand the important concepts and hence why I use so much, and different colors represent different things. Okay, yeah, I can see. I can pick up your points already. You've used pink over here. Okay, so this is really great. What we're looking at is different ways to study. Uh, these are kind of like, some people may think they're unconventional ways of studying, but I'm needing you to be comfortable with the way that you study. How do you study the best to process incoming information? Are you more visual picture? Are you more visual print? This is a print learner. Are you more moving when you are learning? Maybe you need to be skipping when you're learning. Are you needing to sketch while you're learning or watch pictures? And then we've got the more conventional way. What are you doing there, Renee? I'm taking notes because I process better when I take notes. Okay, so, I, yeah, I'm just, I just want to... She's used color too, but she's taking notes. All right, what else? How does this help you? It helps me to focus, and believe me, I have to go back and reflect back to it. You don't look back at your notes? Never. Okay, so that's a good point, because a lot of people who take notes, even in classroom, hardly look back at them. And then people say, how can you do that? Well, actually, you've processed already and you've been listening. So you're actually an auditory, you're listening to what's going on. Some of us like to sit in a group and discuss, and we like to hear each other's voices, Others like to hear their own voice to talk, and you like to talk the lesson back to yourself. Record yourself on a mic. Put your phone there and record your lesson, and then put your earphones in and listen to yourself talking back the lesson. That might help you as an auditory learner. You could then do that where you are going for a bike ride, going for a jog. Put your notes there. Watch tutorials. Watch YouTube videos on science. Some of us prefer that. So please as I've welcomed you into our learning lounge here, won't you 
Use the way that you study the best to get the most out of your studying.